Okay. Uh, again, welcome to Calvary Chapel. Uh, this morning or this afternoon, we're going through a new book, uh, Habakkuk. Uh, you guys are already there. Uh, let me give you a little background on this book so you understand uh, what it's all about. It's only three chapters. It's a short book. And uh, Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets, okay? Uh, he's a minor prophet, and it is believed that he was a contemporary of Jeremiah the prophet, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Zephaniah. All right, they all lived about the same time, uh, probably uh, somewhere around 605, 612 B.C., before Christ. Uh, so 600 years before Christ uh, was the kind of time frame. And so what's happening in this story, in, in this, in this uh, particular book, uh, like I said, it's a minor prophet. He is a prophet. Um, what's going on, and incidentally, let me just pause right there. Anybody know the difference between a minor prophet and a major prophet? A minor prophet and a major prophet. Major prophet being like Jeremiah or Isaiah. Th those are major prophets. Uh, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Obadiah, these are minor prophets, right? Anybody know the difference? Bingo! You get a star for the day. It all comes down to how large or how small the books are. And so Jeremiah and Isaiah are large books, and so they're considered major prophets. Habakkuk is only three chapters, and they're short chapters, and so he's a minor prophet. He doesn't share a whole lot. But let me tell you what's going on in this book. I'm going to summarize the whole book in just a couple of sentences, okay? And then we'll go back through. We'll actually read the chapters over the next week or two, and, and so we can understand what's going on. Uh, but it's a short book, and, and here's what it's basically about. Here's the Reader's Digest version, okay? So uh, Israel and the Jewish people, they've been misbehaving, all right? They haven't been obeying God or his commandments. And, and the, the, the Jewish nation kind of goes up and down where they, they, they are disobedient, they engage in the sinful practices of the world, and God punishes them. And then they repent, and God, you know, they turn back to God, and then uh, God blesses them for a while, then they become complacent, and they fall back into sin, and God punishes them, and so on and so forth, right? That's just been kind of the, the, the history of the nation of Israel. It's just been one big roller coaster. They do good. God blesses, they do bad, God punishes, they do good, they, they repent, they do, do good, God blesses, then they fall away, they repent, uh, they fall into sin, and God punishes them. That's, a, that's been their entire existence, okay, for the Jewish nation. Well, at this time frame, again, roughly 600 years before Christ, Israel is in a state where they have rejected God in his commandments, They've turned away from God, and they've embraced the ways of the world and all of its sinfulness, right? Uh, and so the Assyrian army invades and, 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 and takes Israel into captivity, okay? And, but they hadn't really learned their lesson. And, and so we're at the tail end of the, in, the Assyrian uh, captivity, uh, their invasion into Israel, were at the tend to, tail end of that. And they hadn't learned their lesson, so the prophet Habakkuk decides to pray to God against the sinfulness of the Jewish people. All right? He's praying against the Jewish people because of their sinfulness. And God decides to answer Habakkuk in a way that Habakkuk says, wait a minute, God, I, yeah, I know I've been praying against these people, but I, I think maybe you're going too far, right? I mean, imagine the nerve where he's, he's asking God to, to cause a revival in the land. He's asking God to, to change the heart of the people. And instead of that, God allows not the Assyrians, but another army the Babylonian Empire under King Nebuchadnezzar to come in and then invade Israel. 
So it's one invasion after another, back to back. And Abaka in his, in, his, in his nerve is like, what are you doing, God? This is not what I was talking about when I was talking as if he can advise God on what to do. How foolish was he? Right? He was, he was kind of having a Job moment where Job was complaining to God and, and God's like, Job, listen, man, where were you when I created the foundations of the earth? Do you really think I need your advice on this? Right? This is what he's thinking. And so now Habakkuk's doing the same thing Job did. He's questioning God's sovereignty. He's questioning God's sovereignty. And so what we have in this very short book is that we see two questions posed to God from Habakkuk, and we see God's response in both cases. And after Habakkuk, through his prayer, petitions God, asks God some questions, two questions, God answers those two questions, and then Habakkuk says, oh, I get it, I get it. Who am I to question the sovereignty of God? Understand, in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 28, God says that he works all things out for our good. He did not say he works all things out that are good for our good. He works all things that are out that are pleasant for our good. He doesn't say that. He says, God says, for those that love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, in other words, every believer on the face of this earth, past, present, and future, God will work out every circumstance, good or bad, whether we agree with it or not. He's going to work it out for our good so that we can grow in our walk with him. We can grow in our faith. He does it to draw us to himself back into that love relationship according to his sovereign will. Again, for our good, but ultimately for his glory. Amen? Amen. So be it. So be it. And this is the lesson that Habakkuk has got to learn. So let's read through it together. Uh, we'll take the first question and answer this week. Next week, we'll look at the second question and answer. And then we'll get, in the third week, we'll get to the revelation that Habakkuk has through it all. Amen? Amen. All right. So, we are going to be in chapter 1. But before we begin, let us pray. <laughs> Father God, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word. We pray that we find application for our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Habakkuk 1. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. This is where we get into the first question. Verse 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is power, powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore perverse judgment proceeds. So this is the first question that Habakkuk has. He's saying, Lord, why are you allowing me to see the wickedness of this day? We might ask that same question today, right? We hear about shootings happening all over the, the states, right? Rioting, looting, people going up, shooting people at random there, there's, there's some that will go up to, to just random people in the street and just, just punch them right in the face for no good reason. Complete stranger, unprovoked. There's thievery. There's, there's homicides. Rampant drug use. 
prostitution. We have, we have people that are confused in their own identity. Guys wanting to be girls and girls wanting to be guys. There's people involved in, in sexual sin where guys are sleeping with guys and girls are sleeping with girls and they're swapping partners and you got people you know, trying to have sex with animals. Complete and utter debauchery. We see it. So I think every one of us in this room can relate to Habakkuk in this question. Lord, why are you having me see all this? Why, Lord? Right now we got sirens outside. Sounds like maybe a fire engine or something like this. I don't know. Yep, it is. It's going by right now. I see it. Rushing to some scene. Lord, we just pray for whatever's going on right now that's causing these firemen to, to rush to uh, some type of scene. I don't know what's going on. Lord, you do. We pray that you keep these, these first responders safe. And we pray for whatever emergency is going on right now, Lord, that you are ministering to those folks. In Jesus' name, amen. amen, amen. But we see this daily. All you have to do is turn on the news, and it's one bad story after the next. Right? right. We see it. We're living it. So every one of us can certainly relate to Habakkuk. He's saying, Lord, why are you allowing me to see this? When are you going to bring justice? When are you going to take care of these evil people? This is the question being asked by Habakkuk. And the Lord responds in verse 5. He says, look, among the nations and watch, be utterly astounded, the Lord says. For I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told to you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their, and, and their dignity proceed from them Selves. Their horses are also swifter than the leopards and more fierce than the evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. The cavalry comes from afar. They fly as, as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captivity, uh, captives like sand. They scoff at kings. And princesses are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold, for they heap up earthen mounds and seize it. Then his mind changes, and he transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing this power to his God, little g. So this is the Lord's reply to Abaca. Abaca saying, "Why, Lord?" We need to do something about these sinful people, these sinful Jewish people. Why are you allowing me to see all this debauchery? And, says, and God says, don't worry about it. I'm sending in an army to take them out. The Chaldeans are part of the, part of the Babylonian Empire. And they're fierce. They're even more fierce than the Assyrian army. And I'm going to send them. <laughs> Abba goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. You think maybe you're going a little bit too far? <laughs> I want you to deal with this, but listen, do you really want to bring all these people? They're worse than these people. There is a purpose in it all. There's a reason in it all. When we study the, the, the true life account of Joseph, you guys remember Joseph? He had all those brothers that beat him up, threw him into a pit, lied to their father. Oh, Joseph was mauled by a ferocious beast. He's dead. But in reality, they sold him into slavery. They sold him into slavery. Ended up in 
Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife falsely accused him of rape and tore his clothes off. He ran out naked. Potiphar had him arrested and thrown into prison to be forgotten about. But Pharaoh had a dream that nobody can interpret. And so somebody said, you know what? There is this one guy. He's in prison, but he has the gift of interpreting dreams. He says, bring him, bring him. And he was, to, he was able to accurately interpret Pharaoh's dream. And Pharaoh named him number two in all of the land. Second only to himself. There was to be a big famine. But Joseph had a plan to overcome this famine. And the Bible teaches us that people from all nations came to Joseph for food. Joseph, listen, Joseph endured one trial after another just so God can reposition him to be more effective for him. Amen? Amen. That's true. And eventually Joseph's brother was sent to Joseph by their father to get food because they too, like the rest of the known world, was without. And when Joseph's brothers realized who Joseph was, the Bible teaches us that they were fearful. But Joseph said, look, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. Amen? Amen. That principle is no less true today than it was back then. God will use both the just and the wicked to bring about his good and perfect will according to his sovereignty. Not yours, not mine, but his. Amen? Amen. So be it. So be it. And so it's the idea that, that even in this circumstance where Habakkuk is praying out to the Lord to do something about the sinful people, he was just hoping that God would change their heart so they repent and so they can get back to being in God's good standing. But God is allowing an even greater evil to come in and conquer the Jewish nation for a season because he has a bigger picture in mind. And it really is for Israel's good, for the good of the Jewish nation. Likewise, when things happen in our lives that seemingly seem to be bad, take heart. Be of good cheer because God too is using the circumstances of your life and my life for our greater good. Amen? Amen. And ultimately for his glory. Amen? Amen? Peggy had a heart attack not long ago. She survived. She's here. And now she's got a testimony that she shares almost weekly if not daily. Good. Amen? Amen. That's right. And she is then becomes an encouragement to you and to me. He's working it out. He's taking what seems like a bad circumstance and he's using it for good. her good, your good, my good, and his glory. Amen? Amen. Habakkuk doesn't quite get it yet. Next week, we're going to read about his next question to God and see God's answer, okay? And maybe then we'll see Habakkuk's heart and mind be persuaded. Well, wait a minute. Maybe I don't know everything. Maybe God is smarter than me, all right? Maybe I, I shouldn't be questioning God's sovereignty, all right? But we'll, we'll, we'll look at that next week. Right now, we're going to transition. So glad to see you here this, this afternoon. It's okay. Have a seat. Have a seat. Listen, we're going to transfer, uh, transfer into a time of communion. And I want us to think about our own lives. I want us to think about our own lives. 
I want us to think about some of the circumstances that we've gone through in recent months. The bad circumstances, the trials, the afflictions. Maybe not to us personally, maybe, to, maybe it's to a family member. I want us to think about that. And say, all right, God, how are you using this for my good? And how can we glorify you even in this? And I want you to focus on giving God glory even in the worst of times. Let me, let me say it again. I want you to focus in on how to give God glory even in the worst of times. Because the truth of the matter, the Bible tells us that we should give thanks in all things. Right? Amen? Amen. I'm going to put on a, a, a song. I'm going to pass out communion. When I pass out the communion, the bread and the cup, hang on to it. Don't eat it. Don't drink it. Hang on to it. And then we'll all take communion together, okay? Okay?